Good evening everybody and welcome to the New Year's event 2021 of the Van Mierlo Stichting. We are very happy to host this event for all of you to kick off the new year. And what a year it will be. Many of us hoped for a 2021 that would be just a little bit more normal. But as the acts of domestic terrorism in Washington DC last night show, 2021 seems to start out just as bizarre as 2020 has ended. My name is Koen Brummer, I'm the executive director of the Van Mierlo Stichting and tonight I will be your moderator. I am joined by Afke Groen, who is a researcher at our foundation. A warm welcome to all of you and a special welcome to our two guests of this evening, Martin Senbu and Eveline van Leeuwen. We are very glad to host this lecture with you tonight and especially because we will discuss the important topic of the economics of belonging uh, after the title of the recent book of our keynote speaker Martin Sandbu. Martin Sandbu is European economics commentator for the Financial Times where he has written on the euro crisis and on global financial regulation. He is the author of three books on business ethics, a defense of the euro, and now the economics of belonging, in which, as the subtitle of the book states, he offers a radical plan to win back the left behind and achieve prosperity for all. And indeed, the book outlines radical economic policies that address inequality in Western societies today. And importantly, the book is also the result of Martin Sandbu's attempt to digest the two political shocks of 2016, namely the Brexit vote and the Trump victory, as he writes on the very first page of the book. And now that we have seen to be witnessing the, the grand finale of both of these shocks just this week, we are very much looking forward to hearing his reflections on, on the deeper phenomena that the shocks may represent. And responding to the lecture of Martin Sandbu will be Professor Evelyn van Leeuwen. Uh, she's an expert in urban economics and a scientific director at the Amsterdam Institute for Advanced Metropolitan Solutions. And she also holds the chair uh, of urban economics at Wageningen University. One of her research topics uh, is discontent and populism in regions of decline. And in 2020, for example, she published a research article uh, about the Netherlands investigating the question, does population decline lead to more populist votes? We are very happy to have her tonight and to provide an academic and a Dutch perspective on what Martin Sandu, Sandbu will be speaking about. And before I give the floor to Martin Sandbu, let me briefly mention uh, some practicalities for the organization of this evening. First of all, please be aware that this event is live streamed on YouTube and recorded for later viewing. So if you are in the Zoom call, you can find further information about this in the chat. Second, please make sure to put your microphone on mute. You may leave your camera on if you like. Finally, we will have ample room for questions from our audience in Zoom after hearing from both of our speakers. And if you want to ask a question, please type your question in the chat and mention to whom, Martin or Evelyn, you would like to address uh, your question. Our moderator behind the scenes, who also happens to be named Martin, uh, will select questions from the chat. And if your question is chosen, either me or Kuhn will mention your name. You can then unmute yourself and ask your question. So make sure to keep it short and clear so that we can hear from as many people as possible. But first, let's hear from our keynote speaker tonight, from Martin Sandbu. Martin, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, for tuning in, thank you uh, for 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 having me. Uh, thanks, Evelyn, for for joining me. Um, if you like me, you're, you're still a little bit sort of tired and bleary-eyed from staying up too late and watching, looking at Twitter and watching various TV streams and so on to to see the uh, the sort of shell-shocking scenes uh, at the U.S. Capitol last night. Um, it's the sort of thing that a lot of people who've been following this would say is shocking, but not surprising. Um, I mean, it does certainly look like the, you were saying the grand finale, I hope you're right. 
and it's true that in the same week we've had the final culmination of Brexit. Uh, I think we should count ourselves lucky if these are the grand finales. Um, there may very well be more to come, especially if, as I'm going to argue, the roots of these phenomena lie in large part in the economy. And until those economic uh, causes are changed, we should expect more of the same or worse of the same. Um, so, so as was already mentioned, I started writing this book Every book is a bit of a self-indulgent uh, process, but I started writing it as a way to make sense uh, from my own perspective of this rise of the illiberal backlash, uh, especially in the UK and the US, but that I see as very much uh, cut from the same cloth as similar illiberal movements, mostly of the right, sometimes of the left, uh, across the Western world. Um, and in the process of trying to make sense of this, uh, I engage with this debate about is it economics or is it culture that drives this or, or values or, or politics, but that's not reducible to economics. And as you can see from the title of the book, uh, I've come down very firmly on the sign that economics is a root cause here. Now, um, I, I want to start the lecture by talking a little bit about uh, what I mean by that, uh, so it doesn't come across as a caricature, for, because this is, a, this is a difficult topic, and it's clear that uh, these conflicts, these political conflicts and this political polarization we see to greater or lesser degrees everywhere, has a cultural shape. It's expressed culturally and in terms of values, often irreconcilable values. Uh, but I want to argue that economics really is at the bottom of this. Um, the way I think about the post-war Western model of social economic organization uh, is that it has three pillars. One is, call it liberal democracy, that includes both the institutions of liberal democracy, um, free elections, regular election, the, the rule of law and independent press, all of these things. Uh, and also the, the politics of liberalism to some extent, uh, the push for equality against discrimination, uh, for tolerance of various ways of life and so on. So that's a political pillar. The second pillar is an economic pillar, a promise that everyone would share in the fruits of growth, that the economy would work for everyone. Uh, very much part of this, the three decades roughly after the Second World War, what the French call les Trente Glorieuses, where you really see that everyone is, is lifted together. Uh, and the third pillar is about international openness, building down borders, uh, allowing for, for exchanges between countries in terms of people moving, in terms of trade, in terms of finance, um, and an international dimension of those other two, if you like, international openness. Uh, now, the backlash we've seen in politics uh, is in a sense against the whole model, but I think it's important to see uh, the economic bit of this because all of these populist movements tell a story that, if you listen, uh, is in large part economic. It's basically saying, you were screwed on that second promise. You did not get a good share in what has happened. Uh, the elites have put you in a bad position. So come with us and throw out the whole thing. So throw out also liberal democracy, throw out toleration, throw out globalization and economic openness, because on that second pillar, the promise failed. Uh, and I think it's quite important to recognize, especially for people who identify themselves as centrist or liberals, um, that there is some truth in that claim about the second pillar. Uh, because over about the last 40 years, this is a long process, we have seen these changes in pretty much every Western economy, increasing inequality along a lot of different dimensions, increased income inequality, increased wealth inequality, uh, increased regional inequality be between different parts uh, of different countries. Um, and I'm not going to show you many slides, but I want to show you one now, because I think this is a, a very important part of the story. Um, Let's see if I manage to do this. If I do share now, I think I'm sharing something, but if the hosts tell me that it's not working, then I will try again. Um, these are two graphs uh, of how different regions within the US and within Western Europe uh, developed in the first 30 years after the war and the subsequent 30 years, roughly. Uh, and what these charts show 
on the horizontal axis, the x-axis, it was the initial income per capita or GDP per capita within these subnational regions at the start of one of those two periods, red for the early period, purple for the later period. Uh, and the height on the graph, the y-axis, the vertical axis shows the rate of growth. So if you have a downward slope here, it means that poorer regions, regions that started out poorer, were catching up, were growing faster than the richer ones. So both in Europe, and in the US, this was a really striking phenomenon in the post-war three decades that you saw poorer places catching up with richer ones. So regional inequality, not just individual inequality, was falling fast. That process stagnated around 1980. In some countries, it went into reverse. In quite a few countries, it went into reverse. Certainly in pretty much every country, it stagnated. Um, and I, I wanted to show you that. I will now show my face again. I wanted to show you that because it's it's maybe the politically most salient or most important of these dimensions. It's only recently we're really talking about it. Um, because along many of these dimensions, the people who have been at the harsh end of these changes, who have been the losers of these last 40 years of economic processes, are very often the same as those who are supporting the backlash, the populist, the illiberalism, whatever you want to call it, um, but who have supported forces that want to overthrow in some sense the established order. Uh, and I think we see it in particular with this regional, um, this regional uh, dimension where in every country I've looked at at least, it is the regions that have suffered the most that will also provide the highest electoral support for these anti-system um, anti movements and parties. Um, but there are many other dimensions. We know that the changes over the last 40 years have benefited people with higher formal education and been bad for people with little formal education. Um, they have, as we said, advantaged people in cities and not people in smaller towns uh, or rural areas. They advantage people who can work in the most modern sectors, uh, knowledge intent and intensive sectors, and not people who do or would in a previous time have found their place in more manual, low-skilled, or at least low knowledge intensive, low cognitively intensive uh, jobs. And we might even say that because the current uh, most value-added economic activity tends to thrive in big metropolitan cities uh, with a lot of international exchange in terms of knowledge, social exchange, and so on. The changes have even advantaged people who are comfortable with change, who are comfortable with difference, who are comfortable with moving, you know, people in global, so the global sort of jobs, uh, and not so much people with more traditional attitudes to life, people who maybe want to stay where they near in the small town they were born, and so on. Really, one really interesting statistic I came across when I was writing the book was that back in 2016, you could predict the likelihood that somebody would vote for Trump versus Hillary Clinton by how far away from their town of birth they lived. If you lived very close to where you were born, you were very likely to vote for Trump. If you had moved away from the place you were born, you were very likely to vote Democratic. These patterns have just been reinforced and you can see them in many other countries as well. Um, now, none of that is to say that the politics isn't also cultural and also about values. Of course it is. Um, but this is why the other word in the title of my book is about belonging. Uh, so I think the economic changes we've seen have worked to activate whatever cultural and values differences may already have been there. Uh, we, if we want to account for why uh, immigration, globalization and these things have become much more politically potent in the last couple of decades, I think we need to talk about the economic change that went along with that or very often uh, preceded that. Uh, so belonging to me is a good concept because you can make sense of it both economically. Does the economy work in a way uh, that people feel that they can take part in, that they can participate in, that they can belong to? Uh, but it also makes sense of not just the psychology and the politics of the illiberal, anti-liberal, anti-system backlash, but even its rhetoric. It's about taking back control, it's about taking my country back. Implicit in the entire rhetoric is that 
this country no longer belongs to me. I no longer belong to it. The elites have made me not belong. I want to change that. And that feeling, I think, is at the same time at the heart of much of this politics. It's also, uh, I think, convincingly, we can say that it's also economically driven. Um, and we should admit that it was these insurgent political movements that first expressed it. So the Trumps, the Brexiteers, the Le Pens, and so on, and you'll have your own examples in the Netherlands, were among the first to articulate this frustration. Um, so in a sense, my book is an attempt to catch up uh, and say, look, we need a centrist, liberal, open way of admitting and articulating this frustration and do something that the populists cannot do, which is to offer solutions. Um, so that's, that's what I try to do, to find a way for people in the liberal center to say, yeah, I mean, they've got a point. A lot of people were screwed by the economic changes over the last 40 years. What can we do about it? Uh, and we really need to act because we know from history uh, that without it, if centrist liberals cannot start to throw themselves around and become more radical in their offer to voters, uh, the radicalism that will come instead is much worse. And I think yesterday's events in Washington are an example of that. Uh, one more point about the bro broad diagnosis. I've explained why I think it's about the economy. Of course, many people, and not just the people uh, on the uh, illiberal populist side of things will say that the economic factor is globalization. I don't think it was that. Partly the timing doesn't work uh, and the studies that, uh, that look at this really find that globalization can account for at best uh, a small part of this. Um, we can talk more about this in discussion, but let me just tell you what I think is at work, which is technologically driven structural change in the economy. In every Western country, the number of industrial jobs, factory jobs, factory floor, assembly line jobs peaked around 1980, give or take five years. Uh, it's gone down since then. That was before globalization took off in earnest. Uh, and nobody can believe or should believe uh, that with the technological changes we've had since then, even if we could stop globalization outright, we would go back to all of those jobs. And we wouldn't want to anyway. We have robots doing those things. Um, and so even if you'd had less globalization over the last 40 years, I don't actually think you would have saved any more of these jobs. You would just have automated them away faster. Uh, you know, that's a point a lot of people don't agree with. So we can take it in discussion. But, you know, let me state my position there and then move on to thinking about uh, solutions. Actually, before that, I want to say something about the last year. Uh, so the book, I finished the book just before the pandemic hit uh, the US and Europe. Um, it doesn't talk about the pandemic specifically, but what we've seen uh, in the last year uh, makes me think that the analysis is uh, even more relevant. Now, you'd expect me to say that because I have a book to sell, but let me explain why. The reason is that the pandemic has worked, and especially the economic effects of the pandemic, have worked to reinforce exactly the same fault lines and, and inequalities and divisions that had already been chipping away at our liberal democracies for 40 years. If you look at who is most exposed, both on the health side, but also on the economic side, it's people in jobs that require physical presence. So that means manual jobs. It means the people who stock the supermarket shelves, who clean the four floors, uh, of hospitals, who care for the elderly in elderly care homes, uh, who deliver goods on the door and so on. Uh, and all of these people uh, are either more exposed to contagion or they are more exposed to losing their job because the lockdowns require physical jobs in particular to stop. Uh, whereas people, probably many people in this audience, certainly myself, uh, and, and my fellow panelists, we have jobs that it's a bit boring to do them from home and we can do them in front of a screen. And those are the knowledge intensive jobs, which as I said before, are precisely those that have been the most rewarded uh, over the last 40 years. So the pandemic has reinforced quite dramatically the underlying uh, tensions in the economy. And I hope 
bit more hopefully, it's also made more people aware of how dangerous and intolerable those uh, structural flaws are. And therefore, I hope created more of a political uh, space to come up with new solutions and more fundamental reforms. So what I think we need is something of the scale uh, of what we saw in the 1930s in the US, uh, FDR's New Deal, which was amazingly radical, but very much in defense of a liberal centrist uh, view of society. Uh, and of course, it didn't happen uh, in Europe. Uh, and we saw the disaster that followed um, and then happened after the war. So something of that scale, I think, is needed. We didn't get it after the global financial crisis. We've had enormous political policy measures being taken uh, in the short term to deal with a pandemic. Uh, so my hope is that we can use this window of opportunity to actually make more long term fundamental radical reforms as well. Uh, so let me now talk a bit about what I think those reforms uh, should be. Uh, and I think I'll, I'll go through roughly six points. So I'll sort of try and number them as we go along and we can get, get back to them. But, but the first one has to do with jobs and the labor market. Um, I talked briefly about how some of the inequality that's driven the political polarization we, we struggle with has to do with jobs disappearing and the disappearance of jobs, of those jobs, hitting a particular part of the electorate, people with lower formal education, people in more remote parts of a country rather than the capital city, often men with low education, if we think about factory jobs, uh, and often people with less, especially cognitive training, but also maybe social, social capital, social skills, and so on. Um, so jobs are at the heart of this. But the answer cannot be, I argue in the book, uh, to try to hold on to the jobs that worked 40, 50 years ago, that worked for this, these groups of people 40, 50 years ago. Uh, instead, what we need to do is to embrace this technological change that drives the disappearance of some jobs, jobs and also drives the appearance of new ones. We want to embrace that, but make that sort of job accessible to as many people in as large a part of the national territory as possible. Um, now that's very hard to do, uh, but you don't do it by trying to hold on to what are ultimately unproductive manual jobs, um, which is what you see, have seen in many countries. Uh, I'd like to share a sort of personal observation or even a story that, that at least to me makes sense of this sort of point. So I grew up in Norway. Uh, and in the early 2000s, I was living in the US uh, and I had lunch one day with an economist who was visiting from, from Norway. And we were talking about the differences between Norway and the US as types of economies. And, and we landed on this particular example that is kind of mundane, but I think is quite telling, which is washing your car, having your car washed. So when I was growing up in Norway in the 80s, the only way you could have your car washed unless you did it yourself was to go to one of these uh, service stations with the big machine with the big blue brush rollers that would kind of move over your car. And if you're a kid, you'd love to sit in there and kind of see it go over you. It's kind of spooky. Uh, but it would be a machine that did it. Uh, when I was living in the US, uh, most of the time, at least on the East Coast where I was living, if you wanted to have your car cleaned, you would drive into a service station and three or four uh, men, typically immigrant men who didn't speak very much English, would descend on your car with washcloths and proceed to wash it by hand. Now, those are two different ways of producing the same service or outcome, right? Uh, and it's very instructive to think about why in one country, one technology was prevalent and in another, the other technology was prevalent, where one was machine capital intensive, one person maybe, you know, sometimes programming this machine, uh, maybe a mechanic coming by every now and then, but mostly the machine does the actual physical job, versus one where you have several, you know, a large group of people, a lot of human resource going into uh, washing the car. And the reason, of course, is that you know, salaries in Norway were much higher. It would be uneconomical for a service station to employ three or four people just to wash cars. It made sense. It was more profitable to invest in the machine. Whereas in the US, lots of very low paid labor, 
it's economical, it's profitable to employ them in low productivity, low skilled manual jobs. Uh, but it goes the other way too, right? Because a service station with a machine is much more productive in terms of how many cars you can wash per hour of labor you need to put behind it, it can pay higher salaries. And similarly, if you're going to employ a lot of people doing manual work, you can't pay them all that much because that work isn't very productive in an economic sense. Uh, so it goes both ways. Uh, and what I want you to use this parable for is to think about two kind of ideal type economies, one where labor is expensive, but productive. It's productive because it's expensive. So people substitute machines for labor. Uh, and it's expensive because it's productive. Because you have the machines, you can pay workers more versus one that has the opposite. What we really want to do in every Western country is to opt for the high productivity model. Uh, different countries have succeeded with this in different to different degrees. But what's true of a lot of European countries is that you have these dual labor markets where you have a productive part of the economy and you have a very unproductive, low paid, low skill part of the economy. That's true in the UK that has a very flexible, unregulated labor market. But it's also true in France, in Spain, in Italy, where you have an extremely rigid labor market. It's been changing in recent years, but you have a group that falls outside of that and ends up in very precarious positions. So you have a precariat, to use that word, people in uncertain, low paid, dead end jobs uh, in both kinds of European systems. And of course, in the US, you can tell me about the Netherlands later. How do you move from one to the other? Well, uh, I think what you learn from uh, the countries that have succeeded the best, uh, particularly the European Nordics, uh, is that you actually want to force this substitution for of machines for labor by making labor more expensive. Uh, in the Nordics, that was done through uh, collective bargaining that puts a very high effective floor under wages. Uh, but in other countries, it could be done by much more ambitious minimum wage policies. There are other things you could do at the same time. You could uh, shift some of the risk and the, uh, uh, the adaptation uh, to changing business conditions from the worker to the business. You could have stricter regulations on uh, when you have to forewarn people of their shifts. Uh, you could regulate things like zero hour contracts and so on. Uh, but you want to actually make it expensive to hire people in unproductive ways so that to the extent that businesses create jobs, they will create more productive jobs. Coupled with that, of course, uh, you need things that should almost go without saying, but it turns out different countries spend very different amounts of money on it, namely a lot of uh, resources on training and skills and education, and also a system that makes it easy for workers to move from the bad jobs into the better jobs. Um, it's not very well known that Denmark and Sweden have the highest rate of job to job moves in the EU or in all of Europe, I think, um, higher than, than any other country that's compatible with high productivity, precisely because people move easily from worse jobs to better jobs. And there's a lot of money being put in and resources, human resources being put in to facilitate those moves. Denmark spends more on active market, active, active market policies uh, than any other OECD country. Uh, that's, I spent a bit, uh, a lot of time on this point because I think it's kind of foundational to everything. Um, but you want labor markets to shift in the high skill, high productivity, high pay direction. Element number two of a agenda for radical economic reform, fundamental economic reform, uh, has to do with empowerment. Um, I use the word empowerment because a bit like belonging, it's something that makes sense of both the politics of what we see and the economics of what we see. It's very clear, uh, I think, that a lot of the frustration you've seen built up among people who support the illiberal anti-system backlash is a frustration of disempowerment, of no longer being con in control of their lives, of being bullied about, of uh, having little predictability and a lot of risk uh, and precarity in their own lives. A lot of that happens in the economy, in the workplace especially. Uh, so I think 
from a centrist and from a liberal point of view, we need to see that disempowerment uh, and that exposure to risk and even exposure to exploitation as a restraint on freedom. It's something we really need to care about. And so we need economic policies for empowerment. Um, I've talked about the labor market, but they can be, uh, they can be elsewhere. We can talk about uh, how a lot of us have few alternatives to using the major uh, platforms, for example. We can think about how a small business will struggle to compete uh, against Amazon or a small hotel, how they will compete against the Airbnb uh, or how local taxi drivers will compete against Uber. There are power issues there too that I uh, discuss uh, in the book, but let me just talk about uh, the sort of more purely labor market uh, disempowerment, which is that a lot of people uh, in these groups I've talked about really have no alternative to those bad jobs that they are offered if they're going to survive at all. Uh, and that means it's both undignified, of course, uh, it's psychologically damaging. It's also very bad for productivity because it prevents, it removes this pressure on employers that I have said would be a good thing on making the jobs more, to make the jobs more productive. So, so what do we want? We want obviously a safety net that works, but in practice, in most Western countries, uh, the safety net tends to trap people both at their at low income levels and often to their specific job. And that's because benefits are variously tied to particular jobs or at least to, to full time work because they were built up in the 50s and 60s when that was a model, and partly because they're means tested so that if you actually do manage to improve your situation, you face extremely high effective marginal tax rates if you're at the sort of bottom middle or, or upper lower end of the, of the spectrum. So one example I find telling, a year ago, January 2020, the British bakery chain Greggs gave a 300 pound bonus to all its workers. Now, a lot of the workers in Greggs are people who work, obviously, but still depend on top-ups uh, through government benefits. Uh, but those are means tested. So the effect was that over that 300, most workers would retain 75 pounds, so one quarter. It's an effective marginal tax rate of, of 75%. I think most people, if you try to have an income tax rate of 75% on higher earners, we'd all say, well, that's probably too much. That's a bad idea. It's gonna stop people from working and so on. And somehow we don't seem to have the same uh, outrage reaction when that is the effective situation for a lot of people sort of around the lower middle. Um, now, how do you deal with that? Well, the only solution really is a negative income tax or universal basic income. The only way is to de-link uh, the benefit, benefits uh, from specific jobs and from means. Um, that's a huge discussion, as we all know in itself, so I'm not going to go much into that. I will just you know, put that out there, we can discuss it in afterwards, but I want to say that the main reason I favor universal basic income is not the standard justification for having public welfare benefits, but this reason of empowerment. I think the most important part about a universal basic income is that it allows any worker to say no to unacceptably low paid or badly organized or unproductive jobs and the economic wherewithal to go and look for something else. I think that is an extremely important thing to have. And actually it's something that is, should be a liberal priority because it's freedom enhancing. Um, those two bits, you know, force employers to create more productive jobs and empower people, but especially workers in the workplace, but also small businesses and so on. Uh, productivity and empowerment, those two big uh, elements. If you only do that, you may create some good jobs, but you may well put, you know, destroy a lot of jobs, more jobs than you create. Uh, so the third, uh, the third branch of this program has to be a very active and activist macroeconomic policy. Um, I think that what we've seen, especially in the recovery after the global financial crisis, but actually in decades before, is excessive timidity on behalf of macroeconomic policymakers, whether that's 
politicians doing government budgets and deciding whether to stimulate the economy that way, or central banks doing monetary policy. So I'm not among those who think monetary policy has gone too far or run out of space. I think monetary policy hasn't been doing enough and should be doing more. Um, but whether it's monetary or fiscal policy, the main point is that we need to be much more ambitious in how much, how much demand pressure we want policy to put into the economy. Um, capitalist economies very naturally swing up and down. So we have business cycles, but those business cycles don't affect everyone equally. We tend to look at macroeconomic policy in terms of the average of the economy, the average inflation rate, the unemployment rate, and so on. But actually, once you start looking at different groups of people, you will find that recessions hit worse off people much worse, and people who are already more marginalized in the labor market much worse. So you will see this in country after country, the people who are laid off first in a downturn and hired last in an upswing are those with lower education, those in manual unskilled jobs, uh, often the young uh, or the elderly without formal education, uh, often where we have data on this, uh, minorities, which means that a policy that kind of looks at the average actually makes those already worse off, the left behind, if you like, uh, pay more for fluctuations than those who are better off. Uh, and conversely, we started to see uh, when it's been tried to run the macroeconomy hot and not take the foot off the accelerator too soon, that you actually start bringing more and more people into the labor market that you earlier thought were kind of doomed to, to stay on the margins. Uh, we've seen a lot of change actually in the last, just the last year or two, especially in the US, but also in Europe, in uh, policymakers thinking on this, a much greater willingness to use macroeconomic policy more aggressively. I think that's a good thing. Uh, we need more of it. And I give uh, more detailed arguments in the book. So that's part three, high pressure economies, aggressive, ambitious macroeconomic demand policies, macroeconomic demand management. Um, but that leads to uh, a fourth issue that we also need solutions for. And some of you will have been thinking about this, what about debt? So if you have fiscal stimulus, you build up debt. If you have monetary stimulus, public debt, if you have monetary stimulus, you build up um, private debts, and then you get financial crises and so on. Uh, or alternatively, high debt mountains are a constraint on using these policies. You can't really, because you run out of fiscal space, your debt is too high, you can't actually stimulate with the budgets, um, or your monetary policy doesn't actually have traction on the economy because debt is so high, nobody wants to invest or, or uh, spend anyway. They pay down their debts instead. Um, I agree that debt is a problem, but debt is not the only form of financing there is. There is also equity, that is to say financing where the risk remains with the investor and where if we get a problem, if some economic project doesn't work out, if there's higher unemployment and so on, uh, the financial claim is reduced in a way that it isn't with debts. So if you have a, an economy that's much more equity financed, which is true of the US compared to Europe, you actually have a built-in adaptation mechanism because some of the financial liabilities just disappear if the economy disappoints. Uh, the second advantage that equity has over debt is that it's much better suited for more entrepreneurial activities, more risk-taking activities, precisely those we need if we want to have higher productivity in the economy. And finally, at the personal level, uh, and this depends on the country, but in some countries there are real personal debt problems. Uh, if we had financing for individuals, whether mortgages or student loans or entrepreneurial loans, small business loans, if those were more equity-like, uh, you would also stop people from coming into, falling into debt crises and suffering from debt overhangs. So that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone should sort of sell stocks in themselves, but it means that we should have a policy framework that makes it easy to restructure debts, better, faster, easier bankruptcy procedures. So that even if 
financing happens through debt and debt goes up, it's quite easy to write that debt down when necessary, as it is now because of the huge economic disruption we've had uh, because of COVID. We know that a lot of people, a lot of businesses uh, are now under very high debt burdens because of various policies, bankruptcies have actually fallen, partly because there have been moratoria in some countries like Germany, there has been a lot of public financing to refinance loans. Um, and the bankruptcy systems themselves have slowed down because of COVID. But all of this is going to come and haunt us next year, this year. So it's urgent now uh, to make it possible to restructure debts so that otherwise viable economic activities can go on, but the debt is written down as if the investment had been an equity investment. Uh, that's kind of technical. We can discuss it more if you want a discussion. Uh, point five is about taxation. Uh, I talked at the beginning about how technological changes in the economy are really at the heart of the structural changes and uh, inequality changes we've seen. But policies obviously matter as well. And very often, too often in too many countries, uh, the policy shift since the 80s uh, did not work to counteract the increasing challenges in the in the way the economy was changing structurally but even sometimes made it worse so one case in point uh, in many countries the share of national income going to capital owners have increased at the cost of that going to labor to workers not everywhere but in many countries and in pretty much every country uh, the importance of wealth the uh, the size of private wealth com com compared to national income has gone up a lot. It was maybe two to three times GDP in the 80s. It's six to seven times GDP in most European countries now. So you had a huge increase in wealth. Uh, you've had a, an increase in the inequality of wealth. But if you look at the taxation of capital, it's gone the opposite direction. You would sort of have accepted that even just to keep things neutral, you would have increased taxation of capital if the income of capital and the size of capital wealth increases compared to the economy. In fact, what you've seen is across the board in OECD countries, decade after decade since the 80s, capital income taxes, corporate taxes uh, have all been cut. Uh, so I propose very concretely three tax reforms in the, uh, in the book. Uh, the first and perhaps most important one is a wealth tax. Uh, a few countries still have them. Uh, I understand there's a sort of pseudo wealth tax in the Netherlands on some financial investments, but you will know better. Uh, but a few countries still have them, Switzerland uh, most famously. But I think that uh, the time has come for a fairly high wealth tax uh, in many countries, in all advanced countries, and using the proceeds of that wealth tax to either cut other taxes on capital, or taxes on labor precisely to reinforce some of these things I've talked about earlier, make it more attractive for companies to hire in new and better jobs, make it easier, smooth the transition from one job to the next by reducing the amount of taxes taking off labor incomes, either on the company side or on the individual side. Um, I think a uh, well-designed wealth tax, my sort of rule of thumb is impose a wealth tax above the threshold of wealth that gets you into the top 10%. Um, and uh, have a rate of one or 2% on wealth above that. That's the sort of thing that can raise several percentage points of GDP, quite a lot of money. And that should be uh, a spur to productivity because it actually advantages those who manage to put their capital to more productive work, get a higher return, since the tax rate depends on how much you owed, not how productively you use it. So you penalize unproductive capital owners, you support productive capital owners, you shift the capital in society into more productive, uh, in a more productive direction. The second tax reform, uh, I think a lot of people talk about is to fix the system for international uh, corporate taxation. The Netherlands um, certainly has a job to do there, uh, but that is important. Um, and the third one, is about is taxing carbon, uh, taxing carbon at the true cost it imposes that carbon emissions impose on the global economy. Um, that too uh, could raise quite a lot of money, but it's a tricky one because 
this was very clear with the Gilets Jaunes protests, Gilets Jaunes protests in France. Uh, it is often the people at the bottom in the more remote areas, the left behind, if you like, who, although they don't spend more than wealthier people on carbon intensive uh, goods, uh, they spend a larger share of their income on that. They have worse cars, they need their cars more, they have more expensive heating and so on. Uh, so you need to do carbon taxation in a way that compensates uh, the people at the bottom, or you will be doing the opposite of what you, what you want to do. Uh, so I support a policy that's getting increasing interest from economists. Uh, in the US, it's called carbon tax and dividend. In France, the government's economists have called it a carbon check. The idea is you put in place a high, a really serious carbon tax, and you use the proceeds of that not to fund the government budget, budget but pay it out in equal cash amounts to the whole population, or maybe even you favor more remote left behind areas. Uh, but it would be a carbon tax funding a proto universal basic income, if you like. So those are three tax uh, proposals. Uh, that was the fifth uh, element here. And the sixth one is kind of the biggest, but also the one I can say the least concrete about because it's so difficult, but it's about addressing regional inequality. And I know we'll spend some of the discussion on this, which is why I'll, I'll leave some of it for that. Um, it's a hell of a problem because it really is the structure of modern economies that drive this, uh, the fact that big cities are favored. That is just where the most modern, most productive sectors thrive the most. Uh, so it's very hard, uh, but of course we need to address it. Uh, we can't leave places to rot in the way so many Western countries have done. And indeed you see some of the same in Eastern Europe. Um, just two, two or three quick points. One is that all these other policies I've mentioned will actually help put more resources into left behind areas. A universal basic income will do that. Uh, more capital and wealth taxation will do that because capital owners tend to be more concentrated in the more thriving areas. Uh, so it will compensate some of this extraction that does happen for remote areas. Um, but beyond that, I will just say that the principle here has to be not to try to save the jobs of the past, not simply to try to connect more remote areas into the big cities, but to try what I call a strategy of attraction, uh, which is to try to make as many places as we can attractive to the most modern knowledge jobs as possible. Uh, and I think we're at an intriguing moment here because the pandemic has suddenly given us all a crash course in remote working. There seems to be a space for entrepreneurial policymakers to try to see what incentives can be put in place for businesses to place some of these jobs in areas uh, that used to be deserts for them. It won't be everywhere, but certainly some of the more regional towns uh, should have a prospect here. So that's the sort of thought I want to leave you with. What sort of policy design could we come up with so that a lot of these best jobs, modern jobs, uh, move br more broadly across the national territory? So those were six kind of big policy ideas. Uh, I'll finish off here with a final reflection on the politics of this. Um, this is a book mostly about economic policy, but just in terms of the politics, you know, where, who, who could pursue this sort of program? Uh, some people think it sounds very leftist. I'm, I'm not sure I agree because there are sort of classic leftist things that aren't in here. There's not a big emphasis on redistribution. There's not a big emphasis on the state role in actually running the productive side of the economy. And there's, you know, a sort of uh, an agnostic view of unions. Uh, but there is an embrace of sort of a smart state and a willingness to think of overall strategic planning in the economy. Uh, but I think that is something that liberals especially uh, should be happy with. Uh, there are many other examples, but I mentioned UBI as a freedom enhancing policy. But the whole project here is to shape markets to maximize opportunities for everyone to control their own lives. Uh, not to run their lives for them. Uh, and if that's not a liberal idea, I don't know what is. So I will finish here. Uh, I think I've spent a little bit too long, so I'm sorry about that, but I am very eager to hear Evelyn and, and all of your reactions. So thank you so much for listening 
and uh, I should say Happy New Year too to everyone. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for that very thought-provoking talk, thought, talk and all these nice policy ideas. Uh, before we go to uh, Evelyn, who will be responding to your, to your lecture, I just want to, want to ask you a quick question. Uh, in March, we have general elections uh, here in the Netherlands, as you are aware. Uh, if you had to pick just one idea, one concise uh, uh, policy measure, what a new Dutch cabinet uh, would have to make its priority, what would that be? It's, it's a trick question, isn't it? Because I know too little to be able to give an informed answer, so you'll just pick me apart. But you know, I know more about uh, Dutch attitudes on policy from the European perspective than from, uh, from domestic, uh, domestic uh, policy. Uh, but let me just kind of highlight two points in the list I gave that I think are relevant. One is to be much more um, accommodating of an aggressive, ambitious macroeconomic demand policy. You know, don't worry too much about, don't, don't take your foot off the accelerator and don't force others to do it either. There's a lot of good to have from running the economy a bit hotter. Uh, the second bit is, uh, at least last time I looked, uh, the Netherlands had uh, quite a sort of big accumulation of private debt. Uh, take a look at what I say about making it easy to restructure those debts and rely more on equity in the future or equity-like financing. Uh, because maybe it's sustainable, maybe it's not, but when a debt bubble bursts, it's, you know, it's, it's a really difficult problem. There are no good outcomes, and it's much better to just get it restructured as fast as possible. So put in place frameworks to make that easier. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. I'm, I'm sure we're going to discuss it a bit more later. Um, but first, let's go to uh, Professor Evelyn van Leeuwen. Uh, Evelyn, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, um, Kung, and also thank you very much for inviting me. And Martin, thank you for your very interesting talk uh, and and and, um, and thoughts that you shared with us. Uh, unlike um, unlike you, I, I'm an academic, and I like to have uh, slides also to make sure that I don't uh, talk too long if I get too enthusiastic. Um, what I would like to share, and I think it nicely also fits with your uh, sixth point, uh, Martin, is, is about regional inequalities and discontent, basically. And uh, I have three propositions uh, that I would like uh, to share with you. And the first one is based on the research that Kuhn also mentioned earlier, uh, where we look at populist voting in regions of decline and where we say, okay, this populist voting is indeed related to economic um, uh, regions that are perhaps lagging behind, or, but it's both the composition of the population and the context that matter. My second one is that COVID-19 increases inequalities. Uh, like um, um, Martin, you uh, mentioned uh, as well, um, I would like to go a bit deeper into that. And, and finally, um, uh, since I, I am a, I'm a researcher, so less on what, what politics should do, but a bit, a few reflections on so what now. So um, first is this idea uh, about population decline, because with um, uh, two colleagues, of mine, we were interested in populist voting. And if you live in an area with population decline, would we, uh, do we, uh, or can we find uh, what we call a populist voting markup? So you could think of regions of population decline as regions where, uh, of course, there's a decline in population, there's a decline perhaps in investments, in, in public services, and perhaps also there's a less better or less hope for the future. Um, so we look at, uh, at the populist voting um, um, uh, uh, in, at the neighborhood level, so at, at the zip code four level, and uh, we, we, we analyze those, uh, those shares of votes with using compositional effects, so the, the characteristics of the population, as well as contextual effects. So you also see a map here of the population development in Netherlands, and where do we see most of the decline? So the, the, the the blue colors are the strongest declining areas and the red one is the strongest growth. And you see that in industrial cities, there's more decline uh, and also in the remote countryside, while most of the growth is in the bigger uh, cities in the Randstad area or central area, as well as in Groningen. 
Um, so what we also so see in the areas of population decline is that there is a change or there's a difference in trust in national politicians. So in shrinking areas, there is only 26% of the people that say they trust national politicians, while in areas with growing populations is 39%. So what is the impact on voting behavior? Um, and if we look, so, so we also for the analysis looked at the elections, the national elections of uh, 2012 and 2017, we also, uh, we, we look at people that vote either for PVV or SP, um, and uh, we keep them apart because one, the PVV is more a right-wing uh, political party, SP is a very left-wing political party, and some researchers just take all the populist voting uh, as, as one group of voting, but we, we, we believe, and it also comes out of the results, that there are different reasons to vote on populist parties, so we should not put them all together, we separated them, but what you see here in this graph, so you see that, um, the, I think you can also see my... my um, mouse probably, but you see the, the, um, the, the, the blue and black um, bars, that is the total populate, the total share of votes for PVV in 2012, um, and, the, and the yellow ones uh, are the, in the shrinking area. So you see there, there's a significant difference uh, between, let's say, the average voting for PVV, uh, SP, uh, in shrinking areas compared to the average of the Netherlands, and in particular also it, it's a bit higher than the average in anticipating areas, which are areas not facing population decline yet, but are expected to face it in the coming five to 10 years. And let's say the normal regions that are, are either more steady or growing. Um, so here you see some maps also, where to the, uh, to the left you see the populism in the Netherlands, and this is from Josse de Vogt. He is a, a well-known expert on, on voting patterns and voting behavior. And so uh, you see here a combination of the votes for PVV, SP, and 50 plus. 50 plus is not in our analysis, but it's a relatively small party. So the overall figures are relatively similar. Um, and here you also see that in, in, in the bit in the, in the remote areas, there is a lot of voting for the SP in Flevoland, um, also here in the Rotterdam area, and of course in, in Limburg in this part. And if you then look at this, uh, the right map, there you see the, the this uh, declining anticipating regions are mostly at the, at the uh, edges, uh, but, but you do see some similarities. Of course, you can also look at other um, maps. Here you see unemployment levels at the labor market regions in 2016. And again, so you see here in the north, uh, relatively high unemployment levels, also in Flevoland area, and also here in, in, the, in the Rotterdam and the Rijnmond area, uh, relatively high levels of unemployment. And what we also took into account is broader welfare. And we used the broader welfare index developed by the Rabobank and the University of Utrecht, uh, where they also take into account uh, income levels, but also well being, health, environmental quality, and all such uh, things to measure broader welfare. And here, the red parts are the lowest broader welfare, and, uh, and the greener ones are the highest. And here, you see that in particular in the Randstad area or in the Amsterdam and the Rijnmond area, the Hague, the, the broader welfare is the lowest. And we also know from other research that in general, in, in particular in the, in the Western world, also in the developed Western world, uh, people in cities are, are less healthy on average, are less happy on average. And also actually um, unemployment is higher in, also in our Dutch cities than in our um, rural regions. Um, and so here also in the north, there is a lower broader welfare. Uh, and this is this part of Drenthe is the highest uh, broader welfare. So we, we took these measures into account to try to explain the share of populist voting. And so what, what we find in our analysis uh, is that um, first, if we look at the pop population composition, the, the, the zip code, so the neighborhoods uh, with high shares of populist voting, are um, from the middle generation, also more um, neighborhoods with children, for example, and the lower income groups. So what we also generally find in the literature. Also, we find a difference between uh, votes for the PVV and the SP is that uh, the areas with more Western immigrants vote more for PVV, while actually uh, neighborhoods with more uh, non-Western immigrants vote less for the PVV. And then areas where there are a high number or high share of unemployment benefits, they vote more for the SP. That also makes sense because the left wing SP uh, is, is also, um, uh, employment is a very important point in their program. Um, 
If we look then also a bit at, let's say, location factors, so we also controlled for or took into account the type of neighborhoods. So we have the big cities, we have green urban uh, areas, and we have village centers that vote. So the green urban areas and the village centers vote relatively more populistic um, compared to the big cities. Um, and also we took into account closeness to The Hague. That uh, appeared to be a relevant factor for the PVV voters. And so the closer to The Hague, uh, more people voted for PVV. Um, house prices uh, is more related to voting for the SP. So areas with lower house prices uh, are more likely to vote for um, SP. And we took into account a bit more uh, the, the general economic characteristics where we took regional GDP change, where a higher growth in the regional GDP uh, was related to PVV voters and a decline in regional GDP to SP voters. Um, and when we also take into account broader welfare, that has to do, or PVV voters are people where broader welfare is lower. So from this, we can also uh, conclude to some extent that people that vote for the PVV are more, let's say the general people that are discontent, are anti-elite perhaps, if you look at the De Hague uh, um, variable, that, but also that are anti-immigrants, while the SP voters are more about, um, I, I, well, they, they are in economical terms more left behind. Um, and you can also say that the higher, uh, for the PVV voters, where there's higher regional GDP uh, growth, it could be that the people that vote for PVV, they don't um, benefit from that uh, GDP change, of course. Um, so we don't see a markup. So if we control for these characteristics, we don't see a difference between uh, declining areas and growing areas anymore. So we don't see a markup, but we do see that composition and context matter and that it explains the vote. So people vote for these parties, you could say for a reason, for different reasons, but they, they, um, they do vote for, for the, for the, the, the there is a, a, re, a reason behind it. So then, um, so what does uh, COVID-19 do with this? And as we saw, and as Martin also mentioned already, COVID-19 really increases the inequalities and the gaps that were pre uh, already present even more. So also in the Netherlands, but also in many other countries, we see that people with a lot of wealth uh, saw their wealth increasing and people with low income, with less wealth, less capital, saw that declining as well. And so also in spatial terms and in regional terms, there are growing inequalities because you see, first of all, it's related to the socioeconomic characteristics. So people with a, less, a lower quality of health, um, people that are in certain low paid jobs that it's more difficult um, to, uh, to work from home uh, or to not go to work because they, they have flexible contracts, for example, or they, they uh, don't have um, fixed contracts. Those are the people that are hit most by, uh, by the COVID-19. Also people that live with larger families in small ho homes, small houses, um, the, their living environment, they're worse off, but they also have a higher chance of getting infected. Also, you see differences between neighborhoods where poor neighborhoods with small, home, small homes, small houses with less uh, green urban green areas have much lower quality of life than people in the richer neighborhoods. And we also tend to see a difference between urban and rural areas. I did a study myself during the first lockdown in the Netherlands. We had a survey, at two, over 2,000 people filled in a survey where we looked at the difference between urban and rural people. And here we had mostly high educated people with a job. Um, and we asked about their overall life satisfaction before and during the lockdown. And we had several other questions related to that. And we found that before the first lockdown, there was not a significant differences in, in overall well-being between urban and rural people. While during the first lockdown, there was a significant difference with, let's say before the lockdown, on average, people valued their life with an eight. And during the first lockdown, um, for, for um, people in cities, uh, that went down to around six, 6.5, and people in rural areas, it stayed, well, it stayed, but it went down to seven. So it, it also went down, but um, there, there was a, a significant difference. And when we asked them about, for example, uh, their health and so on, we saw that people in urban areas faced more 
uh, concentration issue uh, issues, problems with sleeplessness, uh, significantly more than people in rural areas. And also when we looked at their physical uh, exercising, we saw that people in urban areas uh, exercise much less, mostly because they would go to the gym before the lockdown. There was no, were no opportunities anymore. Well, people in rural areas actually started to exercise more because they went for a walk. It was nice weather during the first lockdown, so it was easier, but their, their exercising went up. So it also increased urban rural inequalities that are and were already present in the Netherlands to some extent and made it bigger. And we also see, of course, some immigration people moving from the cities to more um, areas with more space and larger homes. Well, also there are uh, growing uh, inequalities in terms of regions. Um, this is an image from uh, the Rabobank where they looked at the, the share of um, or, or the decline in uh, GDP, regional GDP in the Netherlands, uh, where you see uh, that in particular the Amsterdam area is hit is significantly more hit than the other regions because of the open economy and the dependence on tourism. Um, also, uh, the north of the Netherlands because of the harbor of Del Cel. Um, well, the, it, all the activity that's already there even uh, the, the, the declines, but also of course the less gas extraction, with, which has not to do with the COVID nineteen situation. They also looked at um, resilience of reason, uh, regions. They made a kind of prediction, and here they also predict that that uh, yeah the Randstad regions are are less uh, resilient towards the changes we see now toward, uh, towards the challenges of the COVID-19 compared to other regions in the Netherlands. So that also, well here, I, I wouldn't say it increases inequality, but it changes um, uh, the regional economy. Well, I think that will also result in a growing discontent and people feel uh, less belonging. And that is of course, because the vulnerable people are hit most. We already mentioned that in terms of health, uh, health issues, but also access to health. Uh, in terms of residential quality, job insecurity, also young people. Um, I think it will uh, increase the discontent in urban areas more so than in rural areas. Um, and and that is, it, that's really important because there is a lot of, at stake, what Martin also mentioned. Uh, so we want to invest us out of this crisis. We want to build back better. Um, I, I see a, a, a spelling error there, but... Um, we, um, we, we want to invest in, in the energy transition and circularity, and we can only do that if, if we all join in and we all feel uh, that we, we are part of those transitions. And if we leave people out, they don't feel they belong or they are discontent. Um, I think that will also disrupt like we see our countries in, in the, and like we see in the United States, but also in the EU in these transitions. And I think there's even more at stake because also and Andres Rodriguez Bosi, he just had a working paper out where they showed that areas with more populist voting also were hit harder by um, COVID-19 in terms of death, death, death <laughs> related mortality related to COVID-19. So it also has uh, really an impact. Well, so what do we need to, to finish um, um, my part of, of the story of tonight? is uh, actually also very much in line with Martin Sandbu. I think we need high quality, we need a high quality of the living environment. Um, so we, we, there is a revaluation of space, both inside our residences and outside, in urban areas in particular. And I think that's something we have to invest in. It's important for our livability of cities and it's important for the people living there. Then the second one, which is very much in line with Martin, is this high quality jobs. I think if we, if we want to invest and we, we are willing to invest a lot of money also as the uh, Dutch government, we should invest it in high quality jobs because they foster well-being. It makes people feeling that they belong, that they are part of the solution, that they can contribute. And we know from, from uh, also research on happiness and well-being that having a, a doing that really makes people happier and it's good for well-being and feeling have the feeling of belonging. And it will also, can also help us to foster transitions. If we think about the energy transition, for example, there are a lot of additional jobs, at least in the transition itself, in different parts, not only in the Randstad, but all over the Netherlands. Also, if we think of circularity, uh, we, we need investments, we might need more manual work, in particular in this first part of, of uh, circularity in terms of recycling and making, um, repairing uh, products and so on. Those can also be jobs that people 
um, feel that they can contribute to something, we can pay them relatively well, um, and it will add both to well-being and to um, sustainability in the transition. And finally, to do that, I think we need both people and place-based policies. So we need uh, policies that focus on different groups, on, on the needs of the young and the old, of men and women, um, of people with different skills, and indeed education is very important, and flexibility. Um, and also we need to have different uh, policies for urban, rural, and, and different regions. And we already started doing that in the Netherlands as well. Of course, we have the, region, re, um, the recent regional investment schemes and so on. I think that's, that's really relevant and we should also be doing that if we want to build back better. So that is um, what I wanted to uh, share this afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And I will also stop sharing my uh, screen. Thank you for these, for these insights, for sharing your conclusions, not only on populism and these regions of decline, but also on the COVID crisis and the different impact on, on cities and rural areas, and even on uh, what we need for the future and what we would need an, a next government uh, to do. I have many questions on my mind that I would love to ask you, but keeping an eye on the time and also on my feed uh, with questions from the audience, I think uh, we should immediately move on to, to give the floor to several people in our audience, uh, which is what I am going to do now. Um, so again, if I call your name, you can unmute yourself and ask your question directly to either Martin uh, or Evelyn. Please do make sure to keep it short and concise uh, as uh, we want to give the floor to as many people as possible. And I'm going to start by asking Margot Kosters to unmute herself and ask her question um, about social benefits, which is directed to Martin. Yes, good evening, Martin. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it very, very short. Uh, it's a short example from um, in my inner circle, I know somebody who's really on a, on a balance between uh, yeah, an income supported by social benefits um, or climbing a bit higher up the uh, on the financial ladder, so to say. Um, and um, as many are in the public know that hey, you have renting uh, uh, subsidies or yeah, social benefits or um, with healthcare, all these kind of benefits. And I, I feel like they are actually restricting her from climbing up. So I, I hope my question is now a bit clearly formulated, but I, I am curious how you feel about that. Do, do you want me to answer right away or do you want to do a few questions, round up a few questions first? Oh, for me, it's okay. Um, for me, it's okay to listen. Uh, I don't know how the presenter thinks about it. We can give the f we will we would like to give the floor to Martin immediately to uh, to respond to that question. As the next question is directed to Evelyn, so in this way we will well, uh, move on. Very briefly, I just think it's it's an illustration uh, of of this problem. I think is is quite serious that, that there are a large group, and this is true in pretty much every European country, uh, with with you know benefit system we can be, be proud of. Europe on the whole has done better than, than the US over the last 40 years in terms of not letting too many people fall into too much destitution. Um, but the, the downside of those systems is precisely uh, Margot's example that people who are, you know, who kind of could, could be improving their situation um, find that very hard to do because they lose that support. Um, I'll, ju I'll just repeat why that is one of the main reasons why I think we really need to take seriously this, uh, you know, supposedly utopian policy of a negative income tax of universal basic income. That the support we give uh, needs to be unconditional, so that you don't lose it. I, I will add another kind of an aspect of this. Uh, a lot of the people who struggle economically also struggle with economic insecurity. I don't know about the Netherlands, but in many countries they'll have you know, short term jobs or insufficient hours, and, and there'll just be a lot of insecurity in their everyday life. But they will not have a large financial buffer to fall out fall back on 
if something goes wrong, if the job disappears, if they need to take leave for some reason. Um, there are many countries, and even in Norway, this was an issue last year, that there are people, it turns out, to have too little to fall back on when suddenly everything disappears. That's another reason I think we need something a bit more unconditional that's just easy to get out there. Thank you, Martin, and thank you also, Margot, for, for this question and for, for sharing your, your personal experience, uh, the, the experience of your friend. Um, I'm going to move to a question about regional inequality, uh, which I would like to direct to, to Eveline, and the question comes from Busk Werner. So you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, thank you. And also thanks for a very interesting uh, presentations and the food for thought, that's always good. I, I was wondering where the regional inequalities come from. Is it truly the case that there are differences between regions or is it more a reflection of inequalities between people? And the, let's say the people that have more options uh, to, uh, to grow in whatever they want to do, uh, move out of certain regions and the people with uh, fewer options uh, have to stay. Um, and that actually explains the regional differences. Yeah. So here you, you mean regional inequalities in, t in terms of uh, GDP or in terms of? In, in, in terms of income, in terms of uh, uh, health, in terms of wealth, I mean, they are probably very common. Yeah, so I think that it's, it's um, they're, they're in, because I ask this because there are different regional inequalities. And I, and I think that's what I also would like wanted to show with the, the map, for example, with the, the GDP and with um, the broader welfare, is if we look at in monetary terms, if we look at income, of course, in the Netherlands, income is on average higher in the Randstad area. And that is because the high skilled jobs are there. The knowledge intensive jobs are mostly in, in the bigger cities and increasingly also in the Eindhoven, in the Brabant area. While uh, uh, jobs that tend to um, have lower incomes are, are more spread over the country. Uh, but if you then uh, also look at the broader welfare, then we see it's not necessarily the place with on average the highest income is also the place with the highest broader welfare or where people are the happiest. So in, in a lot of uh, cities in particular in our part of the world, in cities you find both the, low, the lowest incomes and the highest incomes and the highest inequalities. Um, well, if you, if you compare that to cities in, in for example, dev developing parts of Europe or developing parts in other countries, then cities are really the place where education is much better, where health services are much better and better accessible. So people are both also happier and healthier in cities compared to rural areas. But in, um, in our part of the world, that's not necessarily the case. So there are differences in terms of broader welfare and happiness. Um, there are differences in terms of uh, GDP, so production at the regional level, um, and so so there there are different different differences that has to do with the, the structure of the the sectoral structure and the type of jobs that are present. Um, but the broader welfare also has to do with the availability of green and the space that you have um, around you. Okay, Evelyn, thank you very much for uh, for the answer to uh, Boss's uh, his question. Um, Marco Swan has a question as well on political ideology. Marco, please unmute yourself and ask your question. And I think it is directed to Martin. Yes, correct. Martin, my question is um, at the, the, the economic policies that you propose, but also the economic policies we have in place now, uh, they, they are the result of, the, or they will be the result of political choices. So my question would be, what is the role of political ideology in your uh, proposals? Um, it, for, to me, it feels a little bit like, like a chicken and egg situation. What comes first? Uh, but I'm very curious to your thoughts. Uh, thanks, Monkey. That's an excellent question. Um, look, uh, let me build on something I, I said at the very beginning, which is that one reason, I think, politically for the rise of the liberal backlash and populism is that these movements were actually expressing something a lot of people felt, and in particular in the economy, which most mainstream parties just failed to express. And then mainstream parties, as we know from one country to another, were kind of caught off guard, didn't really know what to do about this. Some tried to copy the populist um, that usually doesn't work because, you know, why, why buy the copy if you can get the original? 
But the way I would answer your question is that there's a role for political ideology, you know, not as a, a sort of Bible that gives you all the answers, but as a form of intellectual work of saying, well, for people who are centrist or liberals and uh, want economies open to the world and support low frictions on borders and so on, how do we understand from our political principles? How do we understand what has gone wrong? We have to admit something's gone wrong. Uh, and from that, then, what do we do about it in a way that is true to, to our principles? So I actually think this is very much work in process at the moment. There's work happening on the kind of policy wonkery end of things, sort of policy technology, if you like, how do we, what sort of policies might work. But I think we're still sort of grasping for ideological frameworks or ideological language to express this. I'm I'm trying to, you know, this book is a modest attempt to try to contribute a bit to that, uh, a sort of storytelling, if you like. Uh, but I think you're seeing quite a lot of change in the last few years. You know, just two examples. One is uh, Boris Johnson in the UK, who, uh, who has emphasized all this leveling up agenda, which really is taking regional inequality, admitting that there's a problem and trying to start saying something about it in, uh, you know, classic Tory framework. Uh, and the other is the European Commission and the and the Green Deal, and also again a focus on on regional inequality and inequalities generally. Uh, again, there's an attempt to start to put together a political language that includes these things that 20 years ago we kind of didn't talk about, uh, and that's why, of course, a lot of voters went elsewhere. So. You know, it's kind of forward looking or rather backward looking. It's not let's find the ideology and we can plug it in. This actually needs to be developed. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin. Um, the next person we would like to give the floor is Petra Stine. Uh, for Martin, uh, she's a senator for D66 as well. And she has a question on civil society, which I think is quite interesting for uh, the both of you. So I would like to. Uh, let Martin answer the question and let Evelyn answer the question. Hey, thank you very much, Kun. Good evening, everybody. Uh, as some of you might know, I have written a book about the neighborhood I grew up in called the Donnerberg. So in English, it would translate back to Thunder Mountain. I think about 33% of the people in that neighborhood voted for the PVV. But when I did my research, I was actually interested in the reversal of the question. Why did the 77% of the people who also live in this neighborhood, which is low on every statistic, uh, vote differently? And I found that many of them said, I do still see perspective. I am a member of a sports club. I am a member of a community center. I do volunteer work. So they're very much into, they, they felt that they had what we would call social capital. They felt that they were part of the community, even though their circumstances weren't very good. When I looked into the budgets for this neighborhood, which is probably very similar to other neighborhoods, I saw that everything that is related to uh, civil society, creating social capital was cut, but there was still quite some budget for what they call security. So the cameras on the youth center were more expensive than the voluntary salary for the uh, football trainer. So how can we improve civil society and social networks in those neighborhoods where the belonging might not be that strong? All right, Martin, you first. Yeah, no, that, that's a wonderful question, but also a wonderful observation. Uh, because, you know, you use the word perspective, a, a slightly different one is a prospect or even hope. People who think that things could get better uh, tend to not abandon mainstream parties in the way that it's, it's often it's often a sort of expression of despair or having given up on the system uh, to vote, at least for some people, to vote for for the anti-system movements. Um, and, and it makes sense, right? It is very often people who uh, don't have good prospects. Uh, and the other thing I just wanted to add to your observation um, you know, they still, these people, the people you looked at still had kind of good lives, social capital and so on. Uh, one thing we see elsewhere is there was a, there were focus groups being done a year or two ago, uh, but academic, by academic groups in the, in the UK and Brexit voting areas to see, well, what, what is it you want? 
right? So things are changing. What is it you want? One thing, of course, was better jobs, especially for their children. But the thing that really struck me was how many people said, you know, we want a, now, a nice high street with nice shops, a nice town center, if you like, like people in wealthier neighborhoods have. Um, and Evelyn mentioned the word decline. Decline is a horrible thing, right? And you see it physically, you see it in boarded up shops, you see it in derelict buildings, you see it in lack of investment. People complain about the problems of growth, but they're much better problems to have than the problems of decline. So uh, just two sort of quick thoughts about what does this make us think? One is, you know, growth is a good thing. So let's not be scared of running the economy hot. There's, you know, you get a lot of hope in, a bo in boom times. So let's not stop recoveries too fast like Europe did 10 years ago, right? Let's, uh, again, you know, the Netherlands, have an, has a, you have an important voice in Europe here. You know, don't put your foot on the brake. Um, and the other thing is for liberals uh, to understand the importance of public services as a kind of social infrastructure. There was a fantastic study in France after the Gilets Jaunes uh, protest or riots. Turns out that one of the important indicators for where you would have one of these uh, demonstrations, which little town or which little roundabout, a very solid indicator was that, that the last épicerie, the last little supermarket had closed and the last sort of meeting place of people in the town had disappeared. Um, so there's something about the infrastructure social and physical for where people meet and create communities that they're freedom enhancing, right? This should be a liberal priority. Mm. Um, so we need to think harder about that, I think. Do better. Thank Lee, you. Uh, would you like to respond as well to Petra's question? Well, I think it's indeed a very interesting uh, observation and also very relevant. We also know that, that, that indeed uh, being part of social networks, voluntary uh, activities in general are, are very important for, for well-being. It's, it's important for individual well-being. It's also very important for the local well-being. So from that perspective, um, it, it, it's, it's important for several reasons. So it, it's, it's been a, 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 a big mistake not to invest in that. Uh, on the other hand, I think uh, it does not necessarily mean that people would not vote populistic because, uh, of course, in, also in, 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 in strong social networks, um, even though people are happy, uh, but they, they can still have... Uh, share certain feelings or share certain um, concerns, which also might mean that they can also infer for certain ideas that are, for example, anti-elite or uh, that, that could be populist. But uh, so, I, so it could also still enforce, of, of course, certain behavior. But overall, um, I would totally agree that uh, in, in investing in, in voluntary work, in, in, in uh, making people feel people belong is, is very important. Thank you. We are going to, uh, to stay with you, uh, Evelyn, also for, for the next question, um, which is about the region of Brabant. And the question comes from Joop van Katz. Joop, you may unmute yourself. Yeah, not only from me, but uh, I saw somebody else ask the same question. It seems to be uh, slightly an outlier. Can you explain, Evelyn? Yeah, it, it's a good question, and I, I, I must say uh, I already saw it, so I, I gave it some thought. Um, I think, in, so to some extent, of course, uh, uh, Geert Wilders as a, from the PVV, he, he is someone from the South, and I, I think uh, he also, in particular in the beginning, addressed Limburg and also Brabant. Uh, I think he had more attention for those regions, and also he, came, he comes from those regions, so people feel more connected to him, so I think that's perhaps the, 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 the easy, the first easy answer. I think if we think of the regional development, of course, also in Brabant has been, uh, uh, that's been uh, also former industrial region in Brabant uh, and, and, um, and there has been a lot of decline, industrial decline, of course, there. Uh, and recently um, there has been a revival, uh, mostly because of, uh, of, of Philips, but also of Eindhoven area and university there, which has been a revival in more the high end jobs and the knowledge intensive jobs. So um, I, I can very well imagine that uh, there, are, there are also two job markets there for, and for some people it's been more difficult to find uh, jobs and they might feel more left behind. And while there's also been, of course, a change in the structure of the region, but that doesn't um, probably uh, reach, uh, those benefits doesn't reach everyone. 
And just for, for Martin's uh, uh, understanding, uh, the, the province of Bra Brabant is, is growing, it's uh, fairly affluent, but it's still quite uh, prone to, to populism and uh, hence the, that, that's the background of this, uh, this question. We also have uh, many viewers on uh, YouTube and some questions are coming in from YouTube. Now these people can't ask their question themselves, so I'm going to uh, read it. This is a question directed to Martin and it comes from Martijn Bordewijk. And uh, he asks, do you believe there is also a psychological effect which adds to the feeling of being left behind economically? Um, a psychological effect caused by that people compare themselves to others more uh, than ever um, by social media. Uh, I'll be very tentative in my answer because I'm, you know, I'm not a psychologist. Uh, I've read a little bit of the literature, but as a complete lay person, um, I think there is a psychological uh, effect. I think it's driven by how people compare themselves to others, but also how they compare themselves to themselves in the past and also to what they had more or less reasonably expected from their lives. Um, and sometimes comparing themselves to groups they feel are alien to them, immigrants, for example. Um, but I think the broader point here is that it does seem from my reading of the psychological literature that you know what you'd think from common sense uh, is correct. Namely that when you're under pressure uh, and that includes economic pressure, when things are tough and you're stressed, you tend to, it seems, adopt uh, more introvert, kind of in-group attitudes, more hostility to people who are different from you, more of a focus on us versus them, them uh, and a greater willingness to accept authoritarian values and authoritarian modes of, um, of leadership. So, you know, you look for a strong man in a crisis sort of thing. Um, I'm caricaturing, but from what I've seen in the literature, that is a phenomenon that, that is established. It's kind of what we'd expect from history and literature and, and casual observation too. So, uh, so yes, I think there's a, an important psychological element uh, of all of this. Uh, but I think in terms of, if you want to think about policy and politics, well, politics can affect psychology and what politicians say and the stories they let people recognize themselves in are hugely important. But in terms of practical policy, I don't know that there's that much you can do to change people's psychology and their values directly, at least not in the short run. You can work on education, but you can change the conditions in which those uh, psychological phenomena are triggered or not, or, or become politically activated. Uh, and that's an argument uh, I give for why we should even if you think it's not all about the economy, the economy at least is something we can do something about. Uh, so let's do it. Martin, a quick follow-up question from me. Now we're discussing uh, psychology. Um, we talked about this before the, the event just, uh, just an hour ago. Cas uh, Mudde, who's a leading uh, academic on, on populism, uh, he wrote a piece in The Guardian after the events in Washington uh, last night. And he said uh, specifically that uh, too much talk about the left behind or economic anxiety would only fuel uprisings such as these. And I understand, understand you saw the piece, but you haven't read it yet. But uh, I'm sure you've encountered these arguments before after having published your book. Uh, uh, how would you respond? Yeah, I, I think this is a... I have a lot of respect for Kass. I've learned a lot from him. Um, this seems to be an, an instance of this argument that you don't want to legitimize illegitimate behavior. Uh, and that's true. There's nothing legitimate about storming the capital, for instance. And there's nothing legitimate about what a lot of these movements say or want to do or do when they're in power. Um, now, but, but I don't think that if there is some truth to the economic part of their message, uh, that we either legitimize the other behavior by accepting that uh, or that we should, you know, therefore not accept it and not do anything about it. On the contrary, I think you enhance their effective legitimacy if they're the only ones talking about it and everyone will say, well, they're the only ones telling the truth, right? Um, so, so I think you can do both things. Uh, I mean, here's a sort of parallel. Apparently, 
it's uh, it's the case that if you have more if you have lead poisoning in the water especially young men will grow up more aggressive right okay so suppose you have that problem uh, there are two questions here how do you police a community with a lot of lead poisoned angry young men that's one issue but that doesn't mean you shouldn't remove the lead from the water right even if you think about what you do with the people who commit crimes so we need to be able to do both things at the same time and in my perspective the left behind problem is a bit like the lead in the water that's that's very clear um henk goris has a question on uh illiberal right-wing movements as well uh henk please unmute yourself and uh, ask your question yeah, so this question is from Martin, um, and I was wondering, a lot of what you're saying sounds like music to my ears, but if the problem is widening economic inequality uh, along different dimensions, it would be rational for, for those left behind to vote for redistributive policies of the left. But this is, this is inconsistent with, with what we actually see, because what we see is that it, the movement centers or uh, gravitates around the right wing, the liberal right wing parties. So are the priorities of these left behind misguided? Or is there an alternative explanation? So what's, how can we, how, how, can, how can you explain this? No, that, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think if you ask many of those voters, they will say, you know, Donald Trump or whoever will bring the good jobs back. Uh, so I think the, the rationalization, the self-rationalization of the vote is in part in economic terms. And certainly some of the promises that are made are, if not redistributive in a direct sense, they are about people getting better off economically because the good jobs will be back. And, uh, and part of it is about, you know, taking away or punishing at least those elites that stole your jobs or rigged the system against you and so on. Sometimes not entirely untrue, right? Um, I mean, the policies themselves don't, uh, don't actually achieve that, I don't think. Uh, maybe sometimes they will in the short run and so on. Um, certainly, some of these movements will be more willing to uh, be less cautious in macroeconomic policy and a, and a boom can benefit a lot of people. Um, but I think that's how I would answer the question. And, uh, you know, people like Evelyn and others would have to go into the detailed data. But it seems to me that both the, the offer from these movements and the way people who vote for them talk about it when they're asked, at least by journalists, uh, is an expectation that the economy will change uh, in their favor. I also think it's often about distrust of elites and, and of political parties. And that, is, and, that uh, and these more right-wing parties, they often blame other groups. So it's not that, that and they don't even really come with solutions. They, can, they make some vague uh, promises and they blame others, which I think very much resonates with those people. So it's not their own fault, but it's, it's the fault of others. Uh, and so they don't trust the solutions that perhaps more left-wing uh, parties would offer because they don't trust uh, politicians or, or in general. And, and if I can just add another thought, I think that makes it very important for, for politicians and, and political thinkers uh, to, to find policies that actually do visibly deliver, right, that do fix some of these problems. I mean, we, we hope now that Biden takes office in 13 days. Um, it's really crucial, I think, that they act quite fast. Again, Roosevelt in 1933, it was an amazingly fast radical program that quite quickly showed some results. Uh, because Evelyn is right, uh, part of the problem is distrust and uh, part of that distrust unfortunately is deserved and uh, that has to be earned back. And you do that by delivering results. And that's I think uh, in part uh, an argument, a kind of almost instrumental, slightly cynical argument for things like a universal basic income, carbon tax and dividend you know, a check in the post is a pretty tangible thing. And, and if I can add to that as well, I think also for us or for, for me as a researcher, but I think probably there are also more researchers here. It's also, but by not translating populist voting as just uh, people that are, are discontent, or I think we, um, we need to under, uh, um, research better why they vote in certain ways. So not just count votes or look at political parties, there might be several reasons why people vote for a, a certain party. And that might have to do with the person, it might have has to do with some of the, the contents of the program, uh, it might be for another reason. And I think we, we should also not, and I, I do that myself as well, but we should be careful with just counting votes and we should ask people and do better research on why they vote that way and what are their, their arguments and their reasoning behind it.
Thank you both for this uh, interesting conversation be between uh, yourselves. Um, you both may also mentioned that uh, there are several policies that are, are urgent, you advocate uh, that should be carried out, um, some of them very radical, some of them perhaps less radical. Uh, David Kuiper has a, a, a question about the capacity of governments uh, to carry out this, these policies that you advocate. Again, I would like to uh, address that question to, to the both of you. Perhaps we can start with Martin and, and, uh, and then we will uh, get, come to, to Evelyn. So, uh, David, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, thanks. And basically, you, you summarized it already. Uh, but Martin, in the last few decades, uh, public sector capacity um, in many European countries has declined uh, due to austerity measures after the financial crisis. Um, do you think current capacity of the public sector is actually sufficient to carry out the reforms that you advocate? And if not, how can we um, quickly rebuild? No, that's a really good question, and, and one that you know, as a country, you know, depends a lot on the country in question. So it's hard to give a, a very clear answer. Uh, let me first very quickly answer the question I thought you were going to ask, uh, because some people say, well, governments can't do this thing because of globalization, and that ties their hands. So I will just say, really assert that. I don't think that's true. I think national governments have a lot more room for maneuver than, uh, well, than they say, than they sometimes believe. Um, and I make this argument more at length in the uh, in the book. Uh, but you talk specifically about, I think, the, uh, the bureaucratic capacity almost, so the delivery capacity, the logistical capacity of public sectors. Well, it's going to depend a lot on the policy. Um, but there are two quick answers. Some policies, shouldn't be that hard to uh, to put in place. It's probably easier to put in place a universal basic income than a very technically sophisticated means-tested benefit system where you will end up not reaching everyone you intend to reach because it's too complicated. Uh, so some things are simpler um, than others. Uh, there's no public sector capacity constraint on having a more uh, ambitious or aggressive macroeconomic policy. For some of the other things, there may be issues, but I think certainly North European uh, governments really don't have that excuse. Um, I mean, the final answer is sometimes you just have to put your money where your mouth is. Um, we don't have time now, but I could have shown you a slide about how the Nordics uh, really do spend more than everybody else on education as a share of GDP. And I already mentioned how Denmark spends more than anybody else on active labor market policies. You know, if you think these are the right things to do, well, you prioritize, you put money into that. Uh, there will, you know, every policy, you need to actually implement it. Uh, but I think for most advanced economies, um, that shouldn't, we shouldn't really get uh, politicians get away with using that as an excuse. Uh, we are reaching the end of, uh, of the evening um, and I would like to give the floor to the last question for tonight, which is by uh, Annelies van den Berg on Brexit. Annelies, please unmute yourself. Listen, um, uh, we are living in an upside down uh, uh, world, I think, um, and there's no uh, security anymore. That's my opinion of everything, and that's what we're talking about tonight. What do the speakers think of the sense of belonging? That is what we're talking about uh, tonight, that people, that people feel that they belong to each other and go for it. And what do the speakers think that the effect will be of Brexit on uh, the sense of belonging between the British and the rest of Europe? Uh, the British amongst each other, the European amongst each other. Uh, what, do, what do you expect that will ha happen? Right, uh, Martin. And I think Martin would, would be a good, st good start. I think you have a, you know, been <laughs> yeah, no, it's, a it's, pleasure to you. It's a very good and deep question uh, to finish on. I, 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 I want to hear what Evelyn thinks too, but. I mean, the first thing you said was that it feels like there's insecurity uh, everywhere. And 
and I think we should just dwell a little bit on that observation because that's very much part of the psychology of this, I think, that people don't feel uh, safe uh, or that they don't feel that they can expect something they're entitled to expect and sort of basic things like a sort of decent economic life. Uh, the world is changing fast. There's various sources of insecurity. One is just that economies change and jobs that were once secure will no longer be. And I think that speed is changing up. I mentioned factory jobs because that's the sort of thing we associate with some of the populist supporters. But of course, uh, retail jobs will are being killed by the internet. Clerical jobs are being killed by computers. Uh, Apparently, drivers' jobs may soon be outdated because of automated driving and so on. There are a lot of jobs that are going to change. So, uh, the even one way of putting jobs, the challenge here. What, even what, doctors' jobs. Robot even doctors. doctor jobs, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, some of the higher skilled jobs too. Everything that can be automated away will. We should expect that. Uh, but, but one way of maybe saying what my priority is or what I think the principle needs to be is to make make don't resist change but make change safe for people right make people feel better more confident about change you do that by making it benefit them and showing it showing how it benefits them um, so you know we're, we're out of time but we could talk about how you can change the benefit system to fit a world of gig jobs for example make benefits portable so that it doesn't really matter if you have 52 jobs in a year or one job throughout the year in terms of your benefit entitlements that, that's just one example. Um, but you then asked about belonging. Uh, look, I, I think we, uh, partly because of COVID, all of this has become even more intense, uh, but we really are at a sort of pivotal point where things could go either way. Uh, many people make this comparison with the 30s. It kind of feels precarious that way. And I start my book on comparing the Roosevelt inauguration, the we have nothing to fear but fear itself uh, speech with the uh, last sort of semi-free election in Germany that, that Hitler won, that happened on the same weekend, it turns out. So, you know, things can go either way, depending on what you do. So, so I don't know how the belonging is going to develop. Um, for Britain specifically, I don't think that Brexit is going to help at all. It's been enormously divisive. Uh, and it was driven by things that had little to do really with EU membership. So leaving the EU will not solve them and will make solving those problems harder in most cases. Now, maybe it will have given the system that kick in the back that will make them more, you know, change things. The Tories are now for leveling up, right? There's kind of a statist party, or at least part of the party is a sort of statist interventionist uh, inequality beating party. Maybe that's only rhetoric. Who knows? Um, so I kind of share your your sense of uncertainty. Uh, I don't have an answer in terms of where it can go, but I think it's very much in our power to make things go better. So I'd like to just leave on that that optimistic tone that we shouldn't be fatalist about this. You know, similar problems have happened in the past, and solutions have been found to them. And in one sense the fact that COVID has been so dramatic, it's kind of forced every government to be a radical, you know, almost involuntarily. They're, they're, they're kind of forced to be radical because the problem is so big. So it's opened up a space, I think, for doing things very differently. So I'd like to kind of leave a message of hope, really. Things are probably, we can do more than we sometimes think we can do, but we need to decide to do it. Yeah, I think thank you, uh, thank I'm you very on. much, yeah. uh, Martin, for Sorry. that uh, almost okay, uh, Rooseveltian uh, speech uh, uh, or, or closing statement. Uh, I, I would like to give the floor for for a brief moment to Evelyn as well. Yes, yeah, um, so th that's difficult, of course, to come after this. But uh, <laughs> I, 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 I realize um, that. <laughs> what I also would like to add, I think it's also important for the for the government to collaborate with uh, with businesses and with companies, and I think we also increasingly see. Uh, businesses that really want to take responsibility and that want to contribute to society or to sustainability. Uh, I, I think we should embrace that. Also, I think uh, we should not, um, as, a, as a government, uh, try to, I, I think we should do what we, what we are good at, but also I think the responsible uh, responsibility of the government is to take care of the well-being of her citizens, 
Um, so both in terms, in, in, in social terms, in inequality terms, but also in environmental terms on the short term and the long term. And I think that's what a government should focus on. And also when I think of, of, of smaller governments, um, uh, municipalities and so on, uh, they should not do what companies can do as well, where they're good at in terms of market, in terms of economics and so on. They should be the ones uh, um, taking care of those people that feel left behind, uh, both in the short and long term, to think about um, our, 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 our climate, uh, about our environment, um, and, and to find the best um, uh, collaborations with citizens and companies and so on. I think that's, that's a wonderful uh, closing statement as well. Um, that's it for tonight, uh, everyone. I think we had a wonderful discussion on a, on a very urgent uh, topic. And I would like to thank Martin Sandbu and Professor Evelyn van Leeuwen very much for their contributions uh, to this evening, uh, which I'm sure made us a lot smarter and a lot better equipped to face 2021 as well. Um, I would also like to thank all the attendees for this evening, uh, especially the ones who asked such uh, fantastic questions and also the ones who made a generous voluntary donation to the Van Mierlo Stichting because it helps us to continue our work over the coming year. Uh, please keep an eye on our website and follow us on social media to stay updated on more events like this one. Thank you all very much and have a great evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sandu, can I still ask you I'm some still questions? here. Go, go for it. I didn't get the opportunity, but uh, can you hear?